College of New Zealand. My name is Claire Kelly and um, I'm the Divisional Manager of the Trade Negotiations Division of the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And I have the great pleasure today of moderating the first part of today's session on how e-commerce and digital trade can support an inclusive COVID-19 response and recovery. Canada's Ambassador Stephen de Boer will moderate the second part, which is our interactive audience discussion focused on practical steps that the multilateral trading system and policymakers in other forums can take to support and facilitate e-commerce and digital trade. Before introducing the four panellists that we're very fortunate to have with us today, I'd like to say a few words about the session organisers, the Inclusive Trade Action Group. New Zealand, Canada and Chile established the Inclusive Trade Action Group, or ITAG for short, at the APEC Leaders Summit in November 2018. ITAG members are working together to help make trade policies more inclusive and to better ensure that the benefits of trade and investment are more broadly shared. Since November 2018, our three countries have held a number of workshops and meetings to further develop an understanding of Indigenous trade, women's economic empowerment, agriculture, the Sustainable Development Goals, and Small and Medium Enterprise Development. Today's session is a continuation of this cooperation. Our countries were very pleased to launch the Global Trade and Gender Arrangement in August 2020. This is the first ITAG arrangement to be concluded and com commits each participant to address barriers that women face when they participate in trade. At the heart of the arrangement, of the arrangement are cooperation practices which will be designed to share knowledge, best practices and increase women's participation in their economies and in trade. We welcome other WTO members who are committed to women's economic empowerment to join New Zealand, Canada and Chile in the Global Trade and Gender Arrangement and are ready to engage further with those that have an interest. In our view, the expansion of um, e-commerce and digital trade offers the potential to help micro, small and medium enterprises overcome the challenges of scale and distance through selling products direct to consumers online and facilitating business-to-business -business transactions. This presents particular opportunities for those who may have been disadvantaged or underrepresented under traditional trading models, including women, Indigenous peoples, and those in isolated rural areas. At the same time, it is important to understand the challenges that these communities face, including those exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Given that this is Geneva Trade Week, I'd like to add a bit more background to the WTO dimension of our discussion today. In January 2019, following a year of exploratory discussions, approximately 80 WTO members launched negotiations on e-commerce as part of a joint statement initiative. Under this initiative, participating members undertook to seek to achieve a high standard outcome that builds on existing WTO agreements and frameworks with the participation of as many WTO members as possible. Participants recognised and committed to take into account the unique opportunities and challenges faced by members, including developing countries and LDCs, as well as by micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. Despite the pandemic, negotiations continue taking advantage of technology to allow negotiators from a diverse range of WTO members to continue discussions in an inclusive manner. From a New Zealand perspective, a key focus in e-commerce discussions at the WTO has been to work towards an outcome that is both inclusive and commercially meaningful. We also want an outcome that ensures we have the necessary public policy safeguards to address issues such as consumer protection and the protection of personal information in the digital environment. The e-commerce initiative at the WTO is complemented by the work of the informal working group on micro, small and medium-sized enterprises which is exploring ways in which WTO members could better support their participation in global trade. We hope that today's session will provide us with an opportunity to hear firsthand how e-commerce and digital trade can support inclusive development, particularly for medium, small, micro, small and medium enterprises, women, indigenous peoples and those in isolated rural areas. We also look forward to hearing the role that digital technology and e-commerce is playing in economic recovery and response strategies.
Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first panellist, Tracy Hopapa. Tracy is one of New Zealand's most distinguished business leaders. She chairs the Federation of Māori Authorities, known as FOMA, which is the peak body of the Māori economic sector, representing commercially focused Māori authorities. In addition to her role at FOMA, Tracy is an award-winning company director and business advisor who holds numerous government governance roles, including for the New Zealand Treasury, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan New Zealand Forest Investment, the National Advisory Council on the Employment of Women, and the Asia New Zealand Foundation. Tracy holds a Master's in business, business Administration from Massey University and in 2016 was awarded the University's Distinguished Alumni Service Award. In that same year, she was also named as the, one of the BBC's 100 Most Influential Women in the World. Tracy, the floor is yours. Uh, in the Māori language of New Zealand, uh, let me acknowledge you uh, as esteemed guests and leaders from the four corners of the world. It's my pleasure to join you, Claire, and my uh, colleagues and sisters uh, in this conversation. COVID-19 has turned the world upside down. Uh, we watched uh, from Aotearoa New Zealand as countries scrambled across the world in response to unparalleled changes to our ways of living and working. And while the immediate health crisis in New Zealand may have ebbed, uh, we are now turning our attention to how we address the urgent need to rebuild an economy in recession. COVID-19 has focused our attention on what is best for our people and uh, for our communities and offers us a rare opportunity to reconsider how we might make better decisions uh, for uh, economic benefits for all New Zealanders. Within 24 hours uh, COVID of the COVID-19 uh, alert level for in New Zealand, New Zealand businesses were, were changed forever. Some businesses were able to move very quickly from mortar and bricks uh, to online platforms. Others were unable to do so uh, and struggled with that transition. Office buildings closed as teams uh, moved to work from home arrangements and we started to see teams uh, working um, more virtually together uh, and businesses being connected online. In New Zealand, like we have seen across the world, uh, people have now embraced digital technology as the business standard uh, globally. Digital technology has lowered barriers to entry for global trade, for reducing transaction costs, and of doing business between customers, markets, and countries. Being remote, which was previously a barrier to business entry, especially at a global level, uh, is now simply seen as another way in which we do business. And people are now starting to realise that um, business online or virtually is actually the reality in real time. The practicalities of being able to engage with our customers and clients and our team members across the world means businesses and people are now more connected. Uh, we can transact and make deals more quickly and easily. And so while we know that the opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to do this has always been here, and must definitely be a pre-COVID, um, might I say that there wasn't the motivation. Uh, for Māori business, uh, we have seen that our tribal leaders, our business and cultural leaders, have again uh, made uh, uh, the decisions to move to uh, online platforms for engagement with shareholders, with families, uh, tribes and communities across New Zealand and indeed the world, uh, and have moved quickly to consider how we might change our business opportunities and our business models to ensure that we can uh, 
we can uh, start to make the very most of the innovation and the opportunity that presents it itself. Uh, Māori have a significant, um, a, a significant economic presence uh, in terms of primary industries in New Zealand. And so we have worked closely alongside of government and private uh, business and industry uh, to look at how we might reposition our businesses. But we have seen that while people have previously thought we needed to be uh, in business or in country, in person, uh, the idea of being able to get online um, is now, uh, has now become our norm. I suppose the other thing that we have seen um, as, uh, for, as Māori is that the relationships that we have formed across the Pacific Rim and indeed the world uh, in terms of country to country and culture to culture uh, have come to the fore. And many um, connections and linkages uh, with our uh, sister and brother nations, First Nations and Indigenous peoples, not only in Canada and Chile, but around the Pacific Rim have become more meaningful and more immediate in terms of how we can stay connected, uh, how we can maintain relationships and how we can build partnerships. I suppose while we have always been focused on business uh, to consumer relationships, we're now starting to see a closer business to business uh, across international markets. I think too, in terms of Māori's uh, relationship or um, activities uh, in enterprise in uh, food and beverage, uh, we are now starting to look at how online platforms might assist in our uh, supply, distribution and value change uh, uh, plays. We know that for us as Māori and New Zealand people are uh, central to our business models and what we are starting to focus on more and more is how do we prepare our people and how do we build the capacity and capability of our people uh, to engage uh, more readily uh, in digital technology and online business. Uh, we have started to see more engagement through social media and our business owners through ECMEs moving quickly to social media platforms uh, and groups in order to uh, convey and transact their own businesses, especially those in the small to medium sized uh, businesses. For our women, uh, for Wahine Māori, for, uh, we are also starting to see again that they, uh, we are taking the opportunity uh, for digital trade uh, more readily. We have seen the repatriation of New Zealanders coming back into um, Aotearoa before our borders closed as an opportunity to share ideas uh, and to grow talent. And our challenge now is how do we maximise the talent opportunity and potential uh, through uh, those online platforms. Lastly, Claire, if I might, I suppose the, uh, the challenge and the opportunity for us as Māori is recognising that the impact of COVID-19 uh, will be felt uh, more acutely and more immediately uh, for Māori and for our Māori women. Uh, we recognise too that the impact of COVID-19 on the Māori economy in this space uh, will be significant. And uh, the mention, Claire, earlier of the uh, Inclusive Trade Action Group uh, with Canada and Chile and Aotearoa New Zealand is a model which we believe as Māori uh, is um, essential to us being able to transact business in order to maintain relationships, in order to build better country to country, culture to culture, our relationships are for business and for economic growth. We are um, happy to leave it there and to continue the conversation and question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy.
Um, I would now like to um, introduce Crystal Hunt. Crystal is a diversity and belonging specialist and co-chair of the Indigenous Employee Resource Group at Shopify, a leading commerce platform designed for businesses of all sizes. Driven by her commitment to making commerce better for everyone, she seeks to achieve a diverse workforce that is reflective of the Shopify ecosystem and, bring, and the world in which we live. Belonging is at the core of her work and ensuring that everyone at Shopify feels included, valued and heard, bringing more voices to entrepreneurship. Her goals also include implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions of Canada Section 92 recommendations, reducing the barriers to entry into the Shopify workforce for people from underrepresented communities, and building strengthened partnerships with communities and governments across Canada to ensure building trust and awareness of Shopify's economic reconciliation opportunities. Crystal also serves as a council member on the Civic Action Future of Work Champions Council. Crystal, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that although I am speaking to you from my home in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I'm on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, uh, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. I want to encourage all those participating today to have a look into whose territory you're on as well. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to start just before I dive into the topics of discussion today. I would just want to give a very quick snapshot of what Shopify is, who Shopify is, for those who may not have prior knowledge of our business. Uh, in short, Shopify is the leading cloud-based multi-channel commerce platform for businesses of small and, and medium sizes. Um, and of 2019, as of 2019, we are proud to say that we are home to more than 1 million businesses in over 175 countries. Uh, and so merchants use our software, um, in short, to design, set up, um, and manage their stores across multiple sales channels. So Shopify is more than an online store. It's more than folks running a website. Um, people using the platform are merchants. They run their businesses uh, across multiple sales channels, web, mobile, social media, marketplaces, brick and mortar locations, and pop-up shops. Um, and essentially what our platform provides is a centralized one-stop shop for running one's entire business across all of these platforms. Um, and so Shopify, what we're doing is we are building, we are trying to build an 100-year company with an ecosystem of merchants, partners, our people, the Shopify folk, our communities, uh, and the world. And we embrace the opportunity and responsibility to create a more equitable and sustainable future. Um, and so a little bit on our, our mission here at Shopify, we help entrepreneurs, we help people achieve independence um, by starting, running, by making it easier to start, run and grow a business. Um, and, and in the introduction, um, you know, you heard that Shopify believes that the future of commerce has more voices, not fewer. And so our mission to make commerce better for everyone can only be achieved if we do have more voices, both internally at Shopify, but also reflected in our merchant base. So we are in fact, through everything that we do, um, seeking to reduce the barriers to business ownership and to entry into Shopify. And this is because we know that more voices building our product will mean giving life to our mission and lead to more voices on our platform. Um, so I just wanted to give a really quick summary about our vision, our philosophy, what we stand to do, and how we are trying to assist in, indeed, uh, making commerce and e-commerce more inclusive. It is embedded in everything that we do. It is our guiding light. Um, so to jump into two questions um, today, I've taken an approach where I've essentially I've put them together, uh, and I'm going to reflect on a few four specific uh, strategies in which Shopify um, seeks to uh, engage in inclusive development and um, you know, in also engage and participate in economic recovery. So we are in, Shopify is in a unique position to support businesses and contribute to their, their, their continued success. 
It is with the power of our product and our commitment to our mission to make commerce better for everyone um, that we believe we can support um, economic recovery. And we, we can do this by supporting MSMEs and underrepresented communities to run businesses that thrive through four major strategies. Number one, uh, unique, co-created, and culturally relevant education. And this is education for merchants or entrepreneurs, as well as internally, internal education um, for, our, for our shop of folk. Number two, unique and tailored access to our platform. And I'll, I'll dive into a little bit of the specifics about what I mean by unique access to the platform. Uh, number three, inclusive hiring practices. Um, and number four, supporting youth. So with these four strategies, we can't. We, we realize we cannot do this on our own. Yes, we, we are a growing company, uh, the leading e-commerce platform, but we can only do this with, in collaboration and in partnership with government, industry, academia and academic institutions, indigenous communities and training organizations. And so throughout my presentation, I'll showcase how Shopify has supported MSMEs and underrepresented communities via the lens of these strategies and key partnerships. Um, I wanted to also just quickly before I dive into those, I want to touch on the rural piece um, that this strategy in partnering with communities and partnering with government and educational institutes, um, you know, we've seen uh, the impacts also not just in, in major cities, but for example, Canadian entrepreneurs in small towns and rural areas, their um, revenue generated in 2019 was 2.4 billion. Um, and that's outside of Canada's six largest cities. And in 2018, it was 1.5 billion. So, so significant impact. Um, and we know that that we were able to achieve this and to help rural communities um, achieve economic independence by co-creating culturally relevant education, unique and tailored access to the platform, inclusive hiring practices, and supporting you. So I'm going to quickly just talk about um, some ways in which we have um, implemented uh, some of these strategies. So with respect to increasing access, um, as I mentioned, Shopify has played an integral role in supporting and ensuring small businesses in Canada survive through time of unimaginable disruption. Um, in Canada, small businesses represent about, we, they say, 98% of companies in the country. And so when COVID-19 hit, these businesses, they faced unimaginable hurdles, forcing entrepreneurs to reflect, pivot, and find new ways of surviving in this quote unquote new normal. Um, so what did we do? We partnered with the Canadian government uh, to launch Go Digital Canada. Um, and what this did was it brought thousands of small businesses online fast um, and helped them digitize their business. Um, you know, wh wherever they were in their journey, whether they were new to e-commerce or well-established businesses. Um, so Go Digital Canada, it's a central resource hub. Again, touching on the need for culturally relevant um, education. Um, and so what it did was provide a central hub, um, including access to our Shopify Compass, live webinars, and 24-hour support. And with respect to unique access um, and reducing the barriers with respect to access, we also offered the platform for free with an extended 90-day trial. Um, so again, further reducing uh, the barriers to entry, partnering with government, partnering with um, other industry partners. For example, Digital Main Street was one of our industry partners for this uh, Go Digital Canada launch. Um, and we believe that it's in these partners, partnerships rather, with government and industry um, and large private sector organizations like Shopify that the future of civic-minded collaboration exists and it is the right thing to do for Canada. So now just a, a little bit about um, inclusive hiring. So in order to support this new wave of business of a, and established businesses, in fact, we started to realize that come March, when COVID really started to um, take hold, that the nature of the businesses uh, signing up for, for Shopify were those businesses who were well established. They, they, they had their brick and mortars, they had their customer, they had their products well established, but what they needed was an immediate um, very swift solution to bring all of that onto Shopify. And so we knew that we needed to create um, 
you know, a new team and a new hiring approach and needs it to, to support this new wave of merchants. And so what we created was the junior support advisor program. Junior support advisors assist entrepreneurs all over the world with setting up their businesses. They empower entrepreneurs to solve business problems, including marketing, search engine optimization, um, selling on social media, et cetera. Um, junior support advisors gain highly transferable skills, including entrepreneurship, e-commerce, technical problem solving, just to list a few. Um, and so we recognize that the effects of COVID, of course, as we all know, disproportionately affected SMSEs, as well as people from underrepresented groups. So what we did with this particular program, the junior support advisor, is we geared it specifically towards job seekers who face unique barriers to entry into the workforce, specifically those who identify as belonging to one of six underrepresented groups, indigenous uh, folk, racialized, new immigrants and or refugees, persons with disabilities, um, people in rural and or remote areas and gender diverse people. Um, one of the best things about this program is that some of the advisors who do enter into this role, in fact, are, are empowered so much and gain so much knowledge that they in turn go ahead and start their own businesses um, using the Shopify, Shopify platform. So the impact is, is truly measurable. Um, just to touch on inclusive hiring as well, we are charting new waters in inclusive hiring. Um, you know, whereas typically we post our job opportunities on our public careers page and open the floodgates to a very predictable demographic, uh, instead, we chose to build intentional partnerships with community and government organizations uh, across Canada to ensure that we could truly reach the most underrepresented um, job seekers. And so what we did is we engaged in a expansive trust building exercise, building relationships with 100 plus agencies, community organizations and governments um, that seek to help job seekers who face unique barriers to entry. And so the success of this program is that we received nearly 300 plus or more than 300 um, applications for this role and have hired more than 100 now um, folks into this role from underrepresented communities. And we did so by building those grassroots partnerships going in to community, listening, building our program with the feedback from the community and saving space uh, for those who have been most disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, and so the impact is that, or what I would like to say is that um, with respect to economic recovery, we take the approach both of supporting business, but also supporting the workforce and, and finding economic recovery opportunities and inclusive development opportunities in the workforce and creating job opportunities, as well as creating and reducing the barriers to entry for entrepreneurship. Um, and so again, building on the concept of increasing access and education, Shopify is always working um, to create more equitable and sustainable future um, um, by leveraging the power of commerce, of course, um, to support economic independence. And so one example that I wanted to share with, with, the, with the panelists and the attendees today is the work that we've been doing over the past year, um, specifically with respect to developing plans to build a global support system for Indigenous entrepreneurs. And so to realize this mission, Shopify has partnered with a number of indigenous led organizations um, in Canada and across uh, New Zealand, including Raven Indigenous Capital Partners, Entrepreneur, Te Fara Huka Huka, and Rise 2025. And so together with our partners, what are we doing? We are co-creating locally and culturally relevant e-commerce education. Um, we are also providing participants in their communities with free access to the platform for six months. Um, Shopify is actually also providing partners um, with financial contributions to support the scale of their programs. And each, uh, each organization is in fact receiving direct one-on-one -on -one support from our global Indigenous ambassador, Inez White. Um, and so ideally, you know, the, the vision of this is that we will unite these organizations and share, you know, act in an, a, a, an activity of knowledge sharing um, and explore different approaches, uh, unique approaches to Indigenous entrepreneurship education, again, with this 
with the focus on not you know a one size fits all approach to commerce. Although we do have this single platform, we know that there are differing needs with merchants in 175 different countries. We know that our, that the needs will vary, and so this is an example of how we can ensure inclusive development by going to community, listening to community, taking that feedback from community about those unique needs, and modifying our approaches to to suit those needs. Finally, I just want to talk quickly about the, the education piece and not just of merchants, but also focusing on youth. Um, you know, Shopify has realized, you know, in this in this climate, um, in, it, 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 as we look to the youth and, and what is being studied and who is graduating from where, there is a shortage of software engineering graduates. And so what we do here at Shopify is we make community investments that upskill the next generation to prepare for the future of work. Um, and we put, we put specifically build partnerships with organizations whose education programs um, clearly prioritize equity. Um, and again, on the topic of, of what does the, the, the workforce currently look like and what can we anticipate happening, you know, we, we know that more than 42% of Canadian jobs are likely to be affected by automation by 2036. Uh, so so it's, it's an imperative that Canada um, become a digital leader in this space. And for this to happen, we need more software engineering graduates um, and, uh, to fill the demand for growing software. And so all of our computing education programs um, exist to fill this need. And again, with respect to um, equity, we make sure that um, our investments have the, for this to happen, we, make, we try to make sure that we are um, partnering again, I think I already said this, apologies, uh, with organizations who have a focus on equity. And I'll talk very quickly about how we are ensuring that our process with respect to our programs, our computing education programs, uh, prioritize equity. One of our major programs is called Dev Degree. It's a four year work integrated learning program um, that combines an accredited computer science degree with hands on developer experience at Shopify in our work environment. And, and so what, what this program is, it's a dev degree. The intern receives 4,500 hours of work experience, 4,000 hours at, of academic experience in partnership with Carleton University and York University, and $160,000 Canadian in paid tuition, salary, and vacation paid by Shopify. Um, and on the topic of equity, we use a blind application process for this and application and screening process where the names, ethnicities, and gender of applicants has been hidden to remove any kind of bias um, from, this, from this process. Um, and one final thing about what underpins all of this work, um, you know, all of, all of the strategies that I've just mentioned and all of the ways in which we show up to implement those strategies are guided, of course, as I say, by our mission to make commerce better for everyone. But, but what we have is actually, it's a blueprint that guides everything that we do and it's our global diversity and belonging strategy. And we created this strategy in 2019 um, after consulting with 250 employees in 13 countries around the world, making us one of the first companies to build a strategy with a global perspective at the outset. And what we hope this strategy will do and how it's manifested thus far um, is that we will make our work both globally relevant and locally responsive. Again, with the focus on that understanding what's happening in the community so that we can um, have that global impact that makes sense for each region in which we have presence. Um, and it is going to be the basis of how we move forward as a company, um, as we develop annual plans, as we launch programming, and as we track our progress worldwide. So in summary, by supporting one, a unique co-created and culturally relevant education, unique and tailored access to the platform and to e-commerce solutions, inclusive hiring practices, and supporting youth, we can, we, we, we can positively, and we have demonstrated that we can, we can positively contribute to inclusive development and economic recovery for MSMEs and underrepresented communities worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was a fascinating presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce Isabel Longcomin, 
Isabel is a mother of two girls. She is Mapuche. She is a teacher and co-founder of Lirme. After working for 11 years, Isabel decided to leave the classroom with the objective of having a greater impact on education. In 2013, together with two partners, Isabel founded Lirme, a learning management software that seeks to democratize education in the world by delivering a comprehensive platform which aims at having a global operation by 2025 um, or 2027. Lear Me currently impacts 45,000 teachers and 380,000 students and is present in more than 700 educational institutions in Chile, Mexico, Peru, Colombia and Brazil. Isabel, um, the floor is yours and we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. que incluso me emociono eh, eh, cuando, cuando, me, cuando hablamos de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Eh, ¿Me están escuchando? ¿Me confirman, por favor? Sí, Isabel, te escuchamos bien. Solamente hay que te, eh, apagar el, la traducción simultánea para que no lo escuchemos también nosotros. Ah, perfecto. Me da un segundo. Sí. Para dar contenido... Listo, si me dejas nada más dar un mensaje rápido a todos los asistentes. Isabel is, is going to be giving her presentation in Spanish. If anyone needs translation from Spanish to French um, or English, please use the links that I provided on the chat. Isabel, la palabra es tuya. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, yo soy Isabel Lanconil, cofundadora del IRMI. Y agradezco la invitación. Yo llevo un saludo eh, cordial a todos eh, por invitarme a esta instancia. Bueno, lo primero es eh, decir de que todo lo que es la economía digital, la innovación, eh, siempre va a ser un elemento democratizador. Va a permitir que grupos que en otro momento de la historia no hubiesen podido acceder a realizar a comercio internacional con ningún país. Por lo tanto, creo que eh, va a ser siempre positivo de, que, de cualquier tipo de tratado que se haga para potenciar la economía digital va a beneficiar a distintos grupos. En este caso, yo pertenezco al IRMI, que es un software que se comercializa desde Chile y está llegando a distintas partes del mundo. En este contexto, eh, creo que el, la economía digital está permitiendo que distintos grupos puedan acceder a esto. Sin embargo, creo que cualquier tipo de, de tratado, cualquier tipo de, de acuerdo que se logre en instancias como esta, deben considerar eh, las brechas digitales que existen en determinados grupos, como por ejemplo eh, emprendimientos, economías que pertenecen a un área que no son 100% digitales, como por ejemplo la artesanía u otros tipos de desarrollo de productos donde, no, donde los emprendedores no son eh, digitales. Es importante que considere el tema de la brecha digital. En el caso de Chile es principalmente eh, en algunos grupos el tema del acceso a Internet o también eh, el tema de, de poder contar con un computador, un teléfono inteligente, pero creo que lo más eh, clave e importante que se consideren es el tema de conocimiento de alguna forma de lo que implica el comercio digital eh, porque es un área desconocida. Yo creo que todos los emprendimientos a nivel de Latinoamérica independiente del área que correspondan, de alguna forma existe una, eh, una brecha muy grande en cuanto al conocimiento digital. Por lo tanto, eh, es importante que se considere estos elementos eh, en formación y en acceso a conocimiento más específico, porque si no cualquier tipo de, de, de acuerdo internacional va a seguir, estando, va a seguir dejando al margen a, a grupos eh, que podrían eh, perfectamente utilizar y lograr un desarrollo económico gracias a los acuerdos que se obtengan. 
En el caso de, de, de lo que yo represento, que es el GIRMI, que es un software, nosotros tenemos eh, muchas herramientas que yo sé que otros no la tienen y no podrían desarrollar, no podrían utilizar el comercio electrónico. Por lo tanto, básicamente, mi, mi, mi mensaje es que estas instancias internacionales consiguieran esto y veo una gran oportunidad en el comercio eh, eh, digital para que muchos eh, podamos participar de la economía eh, en la misma línea, ¿ya? No con desventaja, porque el comercio electrónico, la economía digital, eh, elimina muchas brechas que existen en la economía tradicional. Elimina brechas de infraestructura, por ejemplo, eh, de quién eres, eh, lo que importa es tu producto, lo que importa es la experiencia que lo entregues como, como proveedor. Por lo tanto, claramente es un elemento que democratiza y puede cambiar radicalmente la, 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 el destino de economías como, como Chile, como Perú y como una cantidad de, de economías similares en Latinoamérica y en el mundo. Y creo que es una de las herramientas que puede permitir de que podamos eh, crecer, que podamos crecer juntos eh, con acuerdos con países más grandes como por ejemplo Canadá. Por lo tanto, eh, encuentro que estas instancias son muy positivas y van, están de alguna forma colocando en la mesa una cantidad de temas para poder eh, hacer mucho más eh, accesible, mucho más eh, sustentable las políticas. Eh, insisto que no olvidemos las brechas que existen, porque si no cualquier tipo de, de, de negociación va a seguir dejando de lado eh, a los grupos que están con estas brechas, ya sean digitales, de acceso a internet, de acceso a un computador, pero creo que lo más grave es el acceso a un conocimiento eh, más profundo en cuanto a, al tema de lo que implica todo el, todo el tema de la economía digital, del comercio internacional. Eh, principalmente ese es mi, es mi aporte. Muchas gracias, Isabel. Thank you very much um, to all our speakers. And um, having heard these really fascinating, practical, real-world perspectives, um, we now tend to consider the, the, the practical steps that the multilateral trading system and policymakers and other forums can take to support and facilitate e-commerce and digital trade. Um, as you know, the audience will soon be able to participate in a discussion on this question, but to set the scene, I'd like to introduce Marion Jansen and ask her to speak on these issues. Marion has recently joined the OECD as, a, as the Director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate. She previously held senior positions in the World Trade Organization, the International Labor Office, and most recently at the International Trade Center. Marion holds a doctorate in economics and has published widely on international trade and global economic governance, and notably co-edited the volume Women Shaping Global Economic Governance. Dr. Jansen, Marion, thank you, and the floor is yours. Um, hello, you hear me. Thank you for the introduction and uh, very interesting for me to listen uh, to the experiences uh, presented by the previous uh, speakers. Um, as you mentioned, um, I have only recently moved uh, to the OECD. I'm leading a director that has a Twitter account and OECD trade and the slogan on our Twitter account is making trade work for all. So the inclusiveness theme in the title of this session is very relevant for the work um, I'm, going, I'm doing at the OECD and for the work the directorate I'm leading is doing. Um, during COVID-19, the topic of digital trade, digitalization has uh, come very much on the, become very much on the forefront. And uh, we definitely have a sense that the ability to go digital, as was mentioned, uh, by previous speakers has been very important to maintain um, the economy running, but will also be important to kickstart economies back out of COVID-19. And how this happens will also determine how inclusive that kickstart is going to be. So I will have a, will try to um, explain how 
what happens at the multilateral level, so far away from the business work that we have just been hearing about, but how what is happening at the multilateral level, for instance, in Geneva, at the WTO, how that affects the stories that we have just been listening about. So during COVID-19, um, a lot of what we have previously been doing physically has moved digitally. We have started to shop from home. We have started to work from home. We have seen in our work at OECD that the work mobility, so moving between your home and your work, has been reduced by 50% in many places. Mm -hmm. The use of bandwidth has increased by 25% during the lockdown in some countries like Canada and Chile by 50%. So that shows to which extent being able to use digital was important during COVID-19. Now, but not everybody had the ability to go digital. It's very important in order to work digitally that you have access to a digital infrastructure that was already raised by Isabel at that point, and that you also have access to the devices you need to go digital. Now, as, I, as you already mentioned, I only recently moved to Paris, and unfortunately, in my new Paris home, I've been without internet access for a number of weeks. So I could not work from home. And there are many places in the world where internet access is an issue. It either it doesn't exist, it is of bad quality, or it is too expensive. This is the first thing policymakers need to address in order for digitalization to be inclusive. Access to the internet will imply investments in infrastructure that's most of the time in a national agenda, but it also implies access to the material you need to build internet access. I'm thinking of cables. I'm thinking into the entire machinery you need in order to make the internet function. Many of these things are important. And how easy it is to import, how expensive it is, this is the kind of things that are decided due through the multilateral trading systems, where, for instance, tariffs are set for the cables that are being sent from one country to the other. We heard access to devices. Isabel also made reference to this. Access to computers, access to phones. These products are typically not produced in your home country. Wherever you are, the majority of the content of those devices will come somewhere from abroad. We have calculated this at the OECD. So how expensive those devices are will again depend on how easy it is to trade across borders and how expensive it is. Now, and in the multilateral trading systems, for instance, through agreements like the WTO Information Technology Agreement, uh, we ensure that it is cheap or uh, uh, to trade and that no tariffs are set on these kind of goods when they are traded. Participation in these kind of agreements will therefore determine how easy it is to access these kind of devices and how cheap, accessible these devices will be for people and individuals across the globe. I've been speaking so far, been speaking so far about how multilateral trading, the multilateral trading system can reduce the costs of trade and therefore reduce the cost of access to the internet and access to devices we need to use the internet. Digitalization itself can also make trading easier. That's something we have seen in the discussions on trade facilitation. We know that um, when you can do your trade, fill in your forms, uh, deal with uh, different kind of authorities digitally, that this reduces the costs of doing business, but also can make trade more inclusive. Um, Isabel used the term, you don't know what the internet key and errors do. It's not always easy to see whom you are dealing with. This can be an advantage. This can be an equalizer. We have, for instance, seen in my previous job at the ITC that digitally being able to bring cross things through the border makes it easier for women to trade. Digitalization can be an equalizer for women. Now, so far, I've often still been speaking about getting physical things across the border. But a lot of digitalization also implies fully digital trade, where something digital crosses the border. For instance, I could read a book digitally, a book that is written in another country. Now, that is a concept of trade that has very much 
changed our way in the multilateral trading system to look at trade and to assess how trade takes place and how trade is priced. The fact that digital trade exists, again, is in my view as a big um, potential to be an equalizer, to, include, uh, to lead to inclusiveness. By making books digitally accessible, information can more easily flow across borders. I remember still that over 30 years ago, I had to take a train from Germany to Switzerland three hours to get access to a book that was accessible in the Swiss library and not in the German library in the city where I was traveling. I could read that book because I was only three hours away from that library. If I had lived in New Zealand or in Canada, I would not have gone to that library. Digital trade, digitalization can very much facilitate the flow of information and contribute to more inclusiveness. At the OECD, we do not negotiate trade agreements. The agreements I refer to, they are negotiated at the WTO, but we very much contribute to a better understanding on the, of these issues and therefore hopefully contribute to making it easy to come up with inclusive trade policies in the digital space. We contributed, for instance, to the handbook on measuring digital trade, which makes it easier for policymakers to understand what digital trade is and how the policies, inclusive policies, can be set. We are also working on a better understanding on how data flow in the context of digital trade and what policies governments are using in order to ensure their populations that trade is not also only inclusive, but also protects their privacy and is secure. But the OECD, and definitely in the Trade and Agricultural Directorate, where we want to make trade work for all, we continue to stand ready to help the speakers in this panel, the audience, and everybody to make digital trade work for all, also as part of the kickstart, hopefully out of this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion. Um, that was um, a very rich um, intervention and um, also deeply fascinating in, in the, the measurement that you've been able to achieve on the impact of um, digitalization. Um, uh, we now turn to our second part of the session today, an audience discussion which we moderated by Ambassador Stephen De Boer of Canada. Ambassador, let me hand the floor over to you. But I would invite um, the participants to use the chat function to pose uh, questions. I can read them here and then we can uh, we can moderate the discussion going forward. So we've just heard very interesting and relevant experiences and perspectives of three impressive uh, business representatives accompanied by Mary and Jansen's sound analysis and uh, research. And I also have to say, if I can be partisan for a moment, as Canada's permanent representative, I want to make a special shout out to Crystal Hunt and to, uh, to Shopify. We're very proud of uh, Shopify here in Geneva and as the Government of Canada. What we've heard so far certainly offers a very good basis for a fruitful discussion and for further exploring the role of digital trade in supporting economic growth for underrepresented groups. And building on the first part of the panel, I believe it would be interesting to continue this discussion and hear from the audience. Uh, on what practical steps the multilateral trading system and policymakers and other forums can take to support and facilitate uh, e-commerce and digital trade. So I would invite um, you to, uh, to ask your questions using um, the chat function. And while we are waiting, and Marion started off, or Marion touched on this, um, to a, large, to a large extent already by talking about the, the ITA, but I would be very interested to hear from the panelists based on their experiences, what 
role policymakers can make in international rules that could support sustainable and inclusive recovery, particularly including for uh, underrepresented groups. In short, how can the trade rules be made um, more inclusive? Maybe I'll start with uh, with you, Marion. So, but, um, I, I believe that um, if we um, accept that digitalization itself has a strong potential to lead to more inclusiveness, then ensuring that trade does what it can to provide access to the digital technologies, both through access to the infrastructure and access to relevant devices, then this can have a very powerful play, a very powerful role in um, in for inclusiveness. So here, this is an area where I would see that, uh, let's say, trade liberalization, digital liberalization itself can play a very powerful role in ensuring inclusiveness. And I, I would expect, but I would be happy to hear the view of uh, the other speakers on this. I had the impression that, for instance, Isabel also would consider that access to digital trade, to digital business, is something that opens the doors to many more businesses in um, different places to participate in business at the national, but also at the international level. And sometimes you can even jump from local to global without having to go via the regional. That's something that was very difficult or much more difficult in traditional trade. And why don't we go in um, reverse order of presentation? So I'll turn to you, Isabel, for any comments you might have. Isabel, después de que termine la traducción, creo que la pregunta es para ti. Por, por mostrarme en el marco de tu estrés. Perdón, ¿me podrías repetir la pregunta, por favor? Eh, vengas para aquí. Vayas a ser uno de los primeros países en hacer esto. Y de... Ambassador, can you please repeat the question so I can translate it to Isabel, please? Sure. The, um, the question was around what what role is there for for policymakers in seeking international rules that support sustainable and inclusive recovery particularly including underrepresented groups so in, in short how can the trade rules be made more inclusive isabel la pregunta es cuál es El, el rol de los políticos en asegurar que las políticas de comercio puedan representar también a comunidades indígenas, especialmente en América Latina, que es donde tú estás ubicada, pero también hay comunidades que no tienen tanta representación en el foro político. también. Y creo que esto es una pregunta... Eh, la verdad es que creo que el rol de la, de la política eh, en general es poder considerar los contextos, eh, en este caso de los países que están participando, eh, y acercar de alguna forma, eh, considerar, la, yo creo que el contexto es lo más importante. Eh, yo creo que todos los tratados van a ser muy exitosos si se considera las características de, lo, de los participantes, Y yo creo que hay un tema aquí de conocimiento y de brechas, como lo indicaba al principio. Eh, y creo que la política en general tiene que hacer como una bajada eh, y ver lo relevante y lo, lo potente que pueden llegar a ser si pueblos eh, o microempresas logran acceder 
eh, a mercados internacionales. Por lo, lo, por lo tanto, creo que el conocer eh, más, más características del contexto de parte de las políticas es un elemento súper importante y va a poder hacer de que, de, de que el objetivo de cualquier tipo de tratado, eh, cualquier objetivo de desarrollo sostenible, sea eh, implementado y tenga éxito. Creo que es uno, uno de los elementos claves. Gracias, Isabel. Ambassador, maybe wait just 10 seconds for the translation to end for everyone that's using translation and then we can continue. Thank you very much. Okay. Gracias, Isabel. Can I now turn to uh, you, Crystal? Thank you. Yes, I'm getting some feedback. Apologies. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, it's definitely reverberating. <laughs> um, okay, I'll try my best. Um, again, those four strategies that I covered in my presentation, apologies if I'm slower, I'm hearing myself right after I speak. Um, those four strategies, although they are essentially a microcosm that exist just in Shopify in terms of the strategy that we take um, to enable inclusive development. I think those four major strategies can be um, replicated for this particular purpose. Um, so I heard Isabel say, start with context gathering. And that's what we do at Shopify. We go to community, we listen to the community, what are the needs of the community, and then we modify our product and our application of our policies um, to, to be accustomed to that need. Um, and so then once you gather that context, you can identify the gaps that exist in knowledge and in access. And so again, we're moving into um, creating policies that enable equal access. But equal access isn't a blanket statement because the needs are different across different communities. So creating an equal playing field means custom access depending on the needs of different countries, different regions, different communities. Um, and so I think that once we can identify the gaps in knowledge and in access, then we can help build that capacity so countries can increase their participation um, in e-commerce. But then beyond, um, capacity um, analysis, identifying those gaps of knowledge and access. Um, I think it has to be a very intentional policy of um, creating affordable ICT infra in infrastructure, pardon, it's the reverberation again, um, and specifically reducing the cost, um, creating subsidies and reducing the costs of internet access. It's, it's pretty, to, to, to me, and, and as we see with the reach that Shopify has been able to have, those, those barriers, as other panelists have covered already today, include the access to the actual technology itself. So we're looking at broadband investment to improve that infra infrastructure, but then, of course, reducing the cost to actually implement and have and, and make use of that infra infrastructure. Thank you uh, very much. Can I now turn to um, you, Tracy? Same question. Kia I think uh, firstly and foremostly at home in terms of the uh, domestic policy, it is about governments uh, making an active and intentional commitment to support the capacity, capability and access of Māori uh, and women and communities. Uh, to uh, ICT, to digital, uh, and to pro to access to that platform for e-commerce. Uh, in terms of country-to-country -country trade and multilateral trade agreements, uh, the idea of an inclusive chapter of policies or commitments uh, within those trade agreements for Indigenous trade, 
for Indigenous to Indigenous uh, people to people trade uh, is critical in this new era as we start to rebuild economies within overall national economies. I think the other thing too is the idea that, and, you know, Crystal and Isabel uh, Marion have also touched on this, the idea that Indigenous and First Nations uh, leaders, um, experts, technical leaders, uh, and otherwise might be involved in the crafting and the design of these policies is essential. Uh, we, if we are going to be inclusive in terms of trade and multilateral trade policy, uh, then they must be uh, designed by those people for whom they might represent and for those communities and those people who may benefit from them. Uh, very much. We're having a number of questions come in, but I wanted, because this so rarely happens, I wanted to ask the panelists if they had questions for um, each other as to their own particular, as to the other uh, presentations. Are there any questions from the panelists themselves to other panelists? Marian, please go ahead. Um, I would uh, like to pick up on Tracy's point on the, um, the, uh, the role of bringing the voice of the different communities to um, the, for instance, trade negotiations, multilateral trade negotiations. Um, I wonder whether Tracy has a view on how this could be done. Um, I know, for instance, that at the, at, um, at the OECD, we work with um, an institution called BIAC, that is a, a, a network, a grouping representing businesses, small and large businesses. So I wonder whether uh, going through that kind of channel, uh, we would as OECD, as, as secretariat, uh, be able to listen to entrepreneurs like the ones present in this panel. Um, that's what I could em envisage from my point of view, but maybe there are other ideas, and I would be very happy to listen to them. Tracy, you had your hand up. Uh, to firstly, um, Ambassador, respond to Marion, I think the idea of engagement uh, with key leaders and experts uh, from across countries and communities uh, domestically makes really good sense. In New Zealand, uh, I chair the Federation of Māori Authorities. We have a direct relationship with our Prime Minister and Ministers of Cabinet, especially in terms of trade policy and export. We also have a national body te taumata, which is representative of Māori business leaders and exporters. Uh, who work directly with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Trade. I think the other point, um, and you will always hear me uh, speaking for women, so is very much around how uh, empowering women uh, in terms of trade, export, and especially connection through digital technology and e-commerce is critical for the growth of our communities. And to acknowledge our sister Isabel, uh, in the work that she's doing, uh, building capacity and capability, knowledge sharing and understanding is crucial. Uh, and the work that Crystal, uh, Jason, the Shopify team are doing, not only in Canada and across the world, but also with our own in New Zealand, is the beginning, Marion, of an ecosystem of exchange uh, that we can start to build those trade platforms upon. Thank you very much. Was there any, uh, did any of the other panelists wish to, um, to jump in at this point? If, if not, we do have a number of questions from our virtual audience. Um, and I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, how can the trade rules encourage supplier diversity and mandating companies to integrate e-commerce platforms so that women and Indigenous suppliers and others can access um these opportunities we've just heard from marion and tracy so why don't i turn to you first crystal 
Thank you, Ambassador. Can you please repeat the question? Absolutely. How can the trade rules encourage supplier diversity and ma mandate companies to integrate e-commerce platforms so that women and Indigenous suppliers and others can access these opportunities? Thank you. I just need a moment to, to consider the question. I would lean back again on partnerships. I think that there perhaps is an approach that is a one size fits all. Um, rules and regulations that perhaps don't necessarily take into consideration the unique experiences, the unique histories, the unique barriers that do exist in Indigenous communities. Um, and to Tracy's point, I think when we consult meaningfully and not just consult, co-create with Indigenous communities and other underrepresented communities, as opposed to implementing on top of these communities without truly doing that context gathering and that meaningful co-creation, we are not creating policies that meet genuinely the needs that exist on the ground. So I would say that in working directly with uh, Indigenous leaders um, across Canada, for example, and yes, Tracy, with the work with, with Jace and myself, um, we can better formulate solutions that do genuinely meet the needs of the communities. And by going into the community and forming these policies in partnership with communities, um, we are creating a foundation of trust, um, which is another side benefit, of course, um, you know, trust that has been broken over years of colonization. Um, and, and so to answer the question about what can um, policymakers do uh, and how can these rules uh, best meet the needs, I think it comes down to truly listening and working uh, in partnership as equal nation to nation. Um, discussions uh, to move forward to reduce the barriers to e-commerce and digital trade. I hope that answers the question. If, if, if I went a little outside of the, uh, the box, please, please do let me know and I can, I can continue. Thank you very much. Were there other panelists that wanted to uh, respond to this question? Tracy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I support uh, Crystal's comments uh, and advice. I think the consideration of how policy uh, and um, how the use of policy and or uh, trade agreements and or arrangements uh, might consider the deficit position uh, that Indigenous and First Nations economies might experience in uh, various ways uh, must be a consideration in the agreements. Uh, that is a highly complex and sensitive area for exploration and response uh, in order for uh, Indigenous and First Nations uh, businesses to fully participate. It must be a consideration. Isabel, did you have anything you wanted to, to say here? Isabel, están preguntando si quieres aportar algo, pero de lo contrario les puedo decir que no tienes ninguna respuesta. Podemos... Um... I think Isabel doesn't have a particular answer to this question, but I also posted some others on the chat.
Mary, did you want to contribute anything to this? Yeah, I could um, maybe add something from the experience of my previous position at International Trade Center, where we very much looked at the topic of e-commerce through the lens of small and medium-sized enterprises. And there, coming back to the question, we did see that in certain parts of the world, uh, notably in a number of African countries, SMEs were indeed complaining about not being given access to certain platforms or this access being expensive. Um, now, this, if these kind of things occur, this goes, of course, against the idea of inclusiveness. Um, one of the aspects of um, parts of the digital world is that it is characterized by what economists would call network externalities. Once you have um, a certain critical mass of business, you can much more easily grow and you become very big. Um, and if that's the case, then you can end up having market power as a company. And if you have market power, you can decide potentially whom you let on your platform and how you don't let on your platform. So there uh, we have um, a number of tools at the policy, national or global policy levels that we would typically use in these cases. Competition policy is something that comes into place where you would like to um, make sure that players do not um, abuse market power. Um, but something as I'm thinking of, and that's something that exists in the multilateral trading system, it's references to universal access. That's something we know from the telecommunications sector where we also have a sector where often there are few players who are very big, but there are certain rules that um, oblige or encourage those providers to ensure that everybody has access to the system. I'm not aware of these kind of rules existing um, for shopping for platforms. Maybe it cannot work, but this is an idea, a concept that um, is maybe relevant for this kind of, um, of discussion. Thank you uh, very much. We don't have much time left, but there's a very short and pithy question coming from the audience that I would like to ask um, all of you, and that is this. What is the, the most relevant barrier you have faced when developing your online business activity? Can I start with you, Tracy? Uh, the overwhelming feedback uh, that I'm receiving is uh, connectivity uh, and uh, access. Uh, and if we are serious about fully participating in the benefits and the opportunities that e-commerce and digital technology provides, uh, then first and foremost, we must have connectivity and we must have the technology available to all of our people and all of our communities across our entire country. Thank you very much, Isabel. While we're waiting, Isabel, yes. Okay. Yes. Puedo imaginarme a esta eh, altura que si la UNEF. La una de las principales barreras que hemos tenido en el desarrollo de la plataforma, eh, que no ha sido grave, pero de alguna forma eh, ha sido el tema de la de legal en otros países. Hay una brecha en conocimiento respecto a poder ver el tema de la propiedad intelectual del software en los distintos países en que nosotros operamos. No hemos tenido eh, mayores problemas, pero es una inquietud eh, que estamos como desarrollando. Es decir, la legalidad de un software que lleva, eh, sale de Chile y que opere en Estados Unidos, que opere en México, que opere en algún país de Asia. Creo que eso ha sido una, una, una dificultad, pero no ha sido una barrera que hemos tenido eh, en el desarrollo del, del software de la plataforma. Uh, 
I, sorry, I'm not sure that that came through. I was turning the floor over to you, Crystal. Thank you. I, I think the barriers are different depending on what we're looking at um, or, or what community we're, we're in. Um, some of the barriers are education, knowledge on business acumen, how to start a business. Some of the barriers are um, access to capital. Um, you know, we know that underrepresented communities are, um, you know, dis discriminated against, you know, uh, historically, and there is significant uh, issues with access to capital to starting business. Um, what are other barriers? Perhaps, you know, in my in my work with um, you know, building the workforce, building teams at Shopify, um, knowledge that Shopify even exists um, is is a barrier um, to inclusive development. If people don't know that, um, you know, these opportunities to to gain employment or these opportunities to become an entrepreneur exist, um, then they can not become an entrepreneur. Um, and finally, one one very interesting um, factor that I, that I have seen is in a community, um, you know, it's sometimes that it only really does take one person to kickstart this, this journey of inspiration. And, and once one entrepreneur becomes successful or starts a business, then the, that ripple effect throughout their community is measurable. Um, and so I think that it's knowledge, I think it's education on how to run a business, access to capital, um, and overall just as humans, our our uh, our biases, our, our implicit associations, our biases that are preventing folks from entering into business and accessing the necessary infrastructure tools and knowledge that they need to to become um, successful entrepreneurs or enter into entrepreneurship at all. Thank you, um, Marion. We have very little time left, but I'll, the last word is yours before I uh, conclude the session. Um, I would pick up uh, themes already mentioned by the previous speakers. Definitely, uh, we have found in work at the International Trade Center that access to the internet and access to technology are um, are important barriers. But I would like to pick up an issue that Isabel mentioned. It's knowledge of the laws and the rules abroad. That's not only relevant for the digital type of products Isabel spoke about, but also for physical goods that are sent. Often, um, entrepreneurs who sell their goods abroad don't know that they may be sent back by the consumer, don't know what the rules are for this, and don't know which costs they uh, incur. And if, as happens in some countries, it's 10 to 20 percent of goods that are returned, that may bring a business close to bankruptcy. That's where policymakers can have an important role, making sure that their consumer laws are known abroad and maybe talking with each other across borders how these rules apply in the case of cross-border digital trade or e-commerce. Thank you uh, very much. And before I conclude the this session, I want to thank Claire Kelly, our first moderator, and the four panelists for their insight view, insightful views. And I also uh, want to acknowledge and take into consideration the, uh, the time differences between Canada, Chile, um, and New Zealand. So we greatly appreciate the fact that you've made uh, yourselves available. I should also say, panelists, that there were a lot of questions that were coming in in the last 10 minutes, unfortunately. So there was a flood at the end. There's a lot of interest. Um, it just didn't, uh, it got a little bit lumpy on us. So we've, we've definitely heard that as the global economy is becoming increasingly digital, it has allowed businesses of all sizes in both developed and developing countries to take advantage of e-commerce markets. But of course, there is a lot more uh, to be done, as all of you have clearly set out. And while the COVID-19 crisis has further catalyzed these opportunities and the ones offered to consumers, it's also exacer exacerbated some of the existing challenges and vulnerabilities of individuals and countries and MISMEs, as you pointed out, have been particularly vulnerable. And what's great about today's presentation is offered a real glimpse into the world of business navigating digital trade, including the perspectives of underrepresented communities. These are supported by the OECD um, analysis. 
And we've received some excellent suggestions on how governments and policymakers can play a role to ensuring more sustainable and inclusive uh, and economic and trade recovery. And the, the, the very important role of public policy to increase digital inclusion and reduce the gender digital um, divide. As indicated at the beginning, Canada, Chile, and New Zealand as AgTech AgTech partners are advancing individually and collectively a series of initiatives that aim at providing further predictability and transparency for businesses, consumers engaged in digital uh, trade. And we also, Canada for our part, is uh, working at the WTO, actively participating in the joint initiatives on MISMEs and e-commerce and ways to promote international trade, also working uh, very hard to advance the Buenos Aires Declaration on Trade and Women's Economic uh, Empowerment, working through the Ottawa Group for a more sustainable and inclusive economy, and working with um, our ITEC partners, our JSI e-commerce negotiations, is obviously establishing a strong rules-based framework that creates more open, transparent, predictable, and secure environment for consumers and business will benefit women and Indigenous entrepreneurs. So we invite you to follow all of these initiatives. We're, it's great to hear from stakeholders. We want to hear from you more. It was great to hear from you panelists because it certainly will help develop policies that provide benefits uh, to all. Much work to be done, but um, we very much appreciate hearing from the four of you pioneers in this area. Thank you very much and have a great day.